we've told you that uncertainties are really important. In this video, I want to talk about some of the places where uncertainty comes from. Why are things so uncertain? Why is life so hard? Um, I won't talk about everything here. Um, in a later video, we'll talk about measurement uncertainty, but I'm going to talk about some other forms of uncertainty that are very widespread. One is thermal noise. What is thermal noise? Well, matter is made of atoms. Atoms. And unless the temperature is absolute zero, they are always moving. So they're vibrating backwards and forwards, wiggling around in different directions, coming towards us and away from us, and whatnot. This has many consequences. Um, the most common is probably in electronics. Let's say you're an electron, and you're flying around. All these atoms are moving, they're bouncing off you. That means your electron can't just move steadily at a uniform speed, it's constantly being bumped by atoms, and so its motion will be a bit more random. This means that when you're measuring voltage in some circuit or current, you won't find a voltage against time. If you look in real detail, it won't be uniform. Likewise, the current won't be uniform, it'll show jumping around, because the electrons are being bumped by all the random motions of the atoms. This is actually called Johnson-Nyquist noise, and it's the fundamental limit to most electronic circuits. Um, you can listen to some yourself, you know, just take a radio and tune it off station, and the hiss you hear is exactly this. It's these random motions of the electrons being bumped around, being amplified by your electronics to make a hissing noise. It's also the case in many other measurements. For example, optics. The atoms in a mirror are vibrating backwards and forwards, which means slight changes in the phase of the light bouncing off the surface of a mirror, which turns out to be a limiting factor in gravity wave detection. That's thermal noise. What's a Poisson noise? This is counting noise. Lots of experiments involve counting things. For example, um, in particle physics, you might be expecting a certain sort of particle to appear with a certain frequency. So there's a certain rate you might expect to get you one photon per second or one Higgs boson per hour or whatever it might be. So you have some sort of detector and it's picking up the flux of particles that are impacting on it. But what on average you might expect a certain rate, that's not what you'll get from moment to moment. Uh, for example, I've spent a lot of my life studying distant galaxies where often you only get one photon of light per um, 20 minutes or so. Now, the average rate is well defined, should be 1 per 20 minutes, but that doesn't mean you get exactly 1 every 20 minutes. You get your clock out and say, mm, 19 and a half minutes, there should be another photon due any time now. It's a random process. It's given by the Poisson distribution. That distribution looks a bit like a Gaussian. Um, and this is a form of uncertainty. When your count rates are very low, when you're only getting a few photons per second or Higgs bosons per second, um, it's a big uncertainty. Another example would be raindrops. Let's say you've got rain landing on a rain gauge. Drops coming down. There'll be an average rate, about be one millimetre of rain per hour. But in any given location, you, especially if the raindrops are big and few and bit far between, like in a thunderstorm, you might get a drop here and nothing there for a 10 second period. The next 10 second period there might be a drop that falls in this bit, but not over here. So while overall the rate of rain with time will be constant, if you measure it in a small area, you'll see big variations from time to time. So that's Poisson noise. Here, for example, is some astronomical data I took. This thing over here is, it turns out, a giant cloud of gas called a space blob lying at a distance of about 10.8 billion light years from the Earth that I discovered a while back. If you look at all these images, these are taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see objects but you can also see in the background, this, it's all very grainy. And that actually is just this Poisson noise. The greater the grain is here. It's less in these images, because these had more photons, so the noise averaged out. This has less photons, so you get more of this noise. And that's the fundamental limit in astronomical observations. OK, on to another form of noise, sampling noise. Now, sampling noise occurs whenever you're trying to measure the properties of a whole population, but you can only measure some of it. So let's look at one example, opinion polls. You have the whole population of Australia, 
some of whom are left wing, some of whom are right wing, some of whom are green, some of whom don't care. Now, let's say you want to find out how they're going to vote at an election. It's not feasible to survey all your 20 something million people, so you might sample you know, three. In this case, you could clearly say that um, one third of the population are red and two thirds are blue. Is that the correct answer? Well, if you'd picked another three, you would have got a different answer. Or another three, yet another answer. If you'd picked all of this bunch, you would have a different answer still. So while there is a true number for the whole population, measuring any particular part of the population does not give you that answer. The bigger your sample, the closer it's going to be, but it will never be perfect. This is called sampling noise, sampling uncertainty. And for a typical opinion poll, it's about 3%. That's for an opinion poll which surveys about 1,000 people. Let's consider another example, exams. We would like an exam to measure how much physics you know, or engineering, or chemistry, or whatever else, you know, what other strange subject you're studying. Now, in principle, to do this, we would have to measure how good you are at every single bit of physics that we've taught you, every single topic in the course, uh, and also on every possible day, because, as you all know, your ability to solve physics problems is better at some times of day than the others. So to really measure your knowledge of physics, we would have to sample how well you can solve every single possible sort of physics problem at every single possible time of day and night and month and year, which is impossible. So instead we do an exam for three hours on a particular day and the exam only tests you on a certain number of topics which is much smaller than the amount you cover in a course. So it could be we've tested you on your uncertainties or Newton's third law or something like that. Is this representative? Well, probably not. It's only an approximation to how good you are on some different topic. If I'd asked a different exam question or a different day but we can't measure everything, so once again we have sampling noise. Perhaps the worst form of uncertainty are unmodeled factors. As a certain American vice president said, unknown unknowns. Let's say, for example, you're rolling a dice. It's thrown through the air and bumps on the ground. In principle, you could calculate which face is going to land upright. It depends on exactly how you throw the dice, the air currents around, the roughness of the table, but we don't know those things. So even though it's not a really random process, it effectively is random because there's a whole bunch of things we can't model because we don't know about that affect it. The economy is another good example. You see lots of economic forecasts saying, you know, Here's the growth rate of the economy up to now, and we predict it's going to do this. And of course, what it usually does is something like this. Why are all economists' predictions so bad? Well, because the economy is really, really complicated, and there are so many things they can't take into account, like some new pop music trend that causes vast numbers of LP sales or downloads, a new technology that comes along, a war somewhere, a tsunami, um, a change in people's appreciation of fine clothing. There's far too many things to going on, and so once again they model some of the factors, but the unmodeled ones give them uncertainty. Earthquakes are an interesting one. Um, for some very high-precision telescopes, it turns out the limitation to how accurately they can measure things is that there are constantly very small-level earthquakes happening in the Earth. Big ones, thankfully, are rare, but small earthquakes happen all the time. And this turns out to be what limits you. Once again, it's something that in principle you could study, but we don't actually know the details of the Earth, the stress everywhere in the Earth, so we can't work it out. Wear and tear. Your instrument might have been very precise when it came out from the shop, but now, after five years in a first-year lab, it may be measuring something a bit different because it was dropped a week ago or a month ago. Those first-year students, they keep dropping their equipment. So you can never quite tell that your equipment is working as it's supposed to work. These are all examples of things that are not models and that form forms of uncertainty. All those sort of things could, in principle, be fixed. Um, though in practice, they can't. 
But it turns out that there is a very, very fundamental form of uncertainty that comes out of quantum mechanics. The theory of quantum mechanics says that things are really, truly, fundamentally unknowable at some level. This so offended Einstein that he famously said, God does not play dice. But it appears that he was wrong. There are some really, truly, fundamentally uncertain things coming out of quantum mechanics on small scales. So uncertainty is not just a consequence of shoddy data, bad experiments, counting errors, sampling problems. It's actually fundamentally built into the universe. Those are the main forms of uncertainty. In another video, we will talk about measurement uncertainty.